Welcome to the Alfred Hitchcock Cinema. This is your host, Stephen Wachowski Jr. and lifetime long metal resident, 70 years and counting, and a movie buff. And these are the films of Alfred Hitchcock. Well, in this case, it's a television show pilot that was broadcast on the Alcoa premiere, an anthology series that lasted only one season. It was never rebroadcast. It's entitled The Jail and was written exclusively for television by Ray Bradbury, who's a longtime sci-fi writer. It also stars John Gavin as a young man charged with an offense against the state. Barry Morris is the guard in the film. Barry Morris was long remembered as the guy who was always looking for the fugitive, David Jansen, on The Fugitive. The story takes place in the far future, where Gavin is promptly marshaled into a huge building crammed with banks and banks of computers. These computers absorb and assess the evidence, circumstances, and facts in his case, and serve as judge, jury, and executioner. Apparently, some people in the future are against the computerized society and help Gavin take on a free line without being called a number or taking orders from a computer. And now, the jail.
21 seconds. But it's all there. One week, 40 hours of testimony, pro and con, fair and square. Now, the jury. Who get the finest, cleanest verdict in the history of law? 10 million words of national, international, and state law are filed, cross-filed, slotted, tabbed, carded, and microfilmed here. Nothing about law this jury doesn't have down to a hair. They think, but do they feel? I want someone to care about me. They'll care. For you. Ah, there. The verdict. Defendant William Fortnum is found guilty as charged and is remanded into the custody of the keeper of the transit machine. The machine. The machine. There to be jailed, imprisoned, or in some fashion incarcerated for the rest of his natural life in a manner best and most efficiently prescribed by that machine. God have mercy on you. Let's hear that last again. Have mercy on you. This way, Mr. Porter, please. Search units standing by at Main and Third, Central and Ninth, Broadway and Second. Main and Third, come in. What is it? Our television search squad. The old part of the city. I know that. Hold it. On your feet.
jail. He means the machine. The machine. Jail. Here it is.
stand up. Come on, stand up.
not go insane. No, I don't think you will. Then why had you done this to me? Why? Why? For the state, for science, for psychology, for philosophy. Uh, have I left anything out? The state? What could be more logical? Huh? Now the state take the body of a criminal away from it. Hand it over, we say. You've done badly by it. But let's give it to some innocent person. I will treat it well, use it right. In this case, a sick man. 48 hours to live, maybe. Who uh, needs a new release on life. And let us give his old, worn-out body to you. Who have sinned and deserve it. Now what could be fairer, a better punishment? Science. Psychology. I'm glad you asked. We need to know, don't we, what is health? The body, the mind, both? Can a diseased body occupied by a well mind survive longer? You can help us find out. What is will? How strong, how weak are men? Some men, tested, go insane quickly. Others hold up. You haven't cracked yet. Bolt. And won't. 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 That's the ticket. We all know the old motto, don't we? A clean mind and a clean body. But what happens when you put a clean mind into a sick body? Or a sick mind into a healthy, clean body? Does the one guarantee the other? Can a sick mind destroy a well body? Can a well mind cure a sick body? Is the mind heredity in the body environment? Is the mind a thing and the body a place? A room to be redecorated when a new mind moves in? You see, it's endlessly fascinating. Whether you're a scientist, a moralist, a politician, or just a plain policeman like myself. Is that what I'd look like? Is that? Is that? Get away from me. You're old. <laughs> You're dying. Get out.
if you have the time. And in case you lose sight of the young man, here's a picture of yourself, as you were an hour ago. It'll help you to remember. Jack, have you heard of the transit machine? There you are, mister. Uh, you'll be all right. You just lay there for a few minutes now. And then I want you to leave. They did this to me. Hello, Jack. Please. My picture, look. See? This is me. Look.
My hand is on the police number. You have one minute, whoever you are. Ellen, have you heard of Transit M2? Oh, since this morning, so much. Arrested, tried, convicted, sentenced, jailed.
on the suit of clothes. You spilled all over, honey. No, not this. This. Look how fine. Strange. Strange. There I am. So near. So far. I never saw myself. Not really. And now.
last month. To ski, yes. He skied over the line. He crossed the border. He does that every year. Just to the bottom of the run, he's back in a few minutes. This year, even for a minute. It was a crime against the state. Just a few minutes. Have you seen the 
another one? No. Did a transfer occur? Were souls exchanged? No, there was no transfer. No souls were exchanged. That one died of a heart attack before it could force anyone outside to use the machine. Peters, you were an old man once. You were a doctor. I remember your record. Eight years ago, before you moved into this division, you did great things for the state. And the state rewarded you when you were old by giving you a new body. This young body. The state, thinking you might be grateful, because the machine that made you young again also gave you this job. Now, at this late date, you're not feeling guilty, are you? I'm sorry that you have the body of another man long since dead. No. And you haven't been going around doing favors for other people like yourself with the machine? Doctor? No. Get him out of here. Yes, sir. It's a fine suit of clothes you've given me. Where is it, Health? Strange story indeed, in a year which I hope will never come. I think I can safely say that vaudeville, or as we often refer to it, the variety show, has always been one of the mainstays of the entertainment business. And this evening we're going to deviate from our usual format to bring you just such a show. Its host, a very favorite comedian of mine, a gentleman who has given us all many wonderful moments. This gentleman is your host. He has some exciting entertainment in mind. The Half Brothers, Peter Nero, Andon's Poodles, Joyce Van Patten and Paul Mazursky, the Harmonicats. Who is this man? Why, you've seen that familiar twinkle in his eye, that smile on his upper lip, that crinkle on his little nose, that do-it-yourself haircut. It's George Goble. No applause, please. See, this isn't the beginning of the show yet. This is just where we do a big dramatic scene to get you all excited. They all do this. See, this is what they call a, uh, I guess you could call this a grabber. <laughs> so for all you folks home watching, here is our grabber. <laughs>
Now, once again, here's George Gold. He said, my name is George Goble, and once I hit my thumb with a hammer and it turned blue, but I didn't cry. <laughs> I'd like to know that. So, to explain, to explain what I'm doing here to my vast gingham and seersucker audience, in my travels, I come across many, many talented performers that I know you folks would enjoy seeing, but don't usually get the chance to. And that's what this show is all about. I've put together a sort of a pot pour, a pop. How do you say that again? Potpourri, a potpourri of entertainment that I think potpourri. Is that what I put together? A potpourri. All right. A potpourri of entertainment that I think you'll enjoy. Ooh. Personally, I like variety shows, and uh, of course, I always did like variety. I'll say that. That is, I liked variety before I met Alice. And she put a stop to that real quick. <laughs> but, uh, but the point that I'm making is before I decided to do a show like this, I figured I'd do a little research to find out what the cur current trend is in television. And to do research, the first thing you need is a couple of secretaries to compile statistics. And that's all there is to it. You've got to have, uh, so we got a couple of secretaries and we started compiling and uh, these secretaries had some pretty interesting statistics, too. <laughs> one of them had better statistics than the other one. <laughs> but the other one could type. <laughs> Which didn't really help too much, because we didn't have a typewriter in the first place. <laughs> but one thing we found out is that the rodeo type shows now are very popular. But my agent wasn't too excited about the idea. For one thing, I don't ride. And they tried to get me to ride. You know, they got a horse there, and I was, uh, oh, I'm going to tell you, this horse was a mean one. He really, this old horse. You talk about a horse kicking and jumping. This old, he was a going Jesse. You know, he comes sashaying out of that barn like that. I said, whoa! Oh, you, this old horse. Then he's back, now, oh, now, now, here he comes. I said, whoa! There he goes. Whoa! You know what this horse did? You want to know what this horse, I'll tell you what he did. Come here. This horse, he kicked and bucked so hard that he spun that saddle all the way around, clear under his stomach. <laughs> now, that did it for me right there. I, I said to him, I said, look, horse, I said, I'm not going to fool around with this at all if we're going to start out with you on top. <laughs> this is for rodeo and right there. And uh, now we found out another favorite kind of show now are medical shows. And my agent said to me, he says, George, what sort of a doctor would you like to be? And I said, well, so how about a surgeon? I think they're nice, but uh, that didn't work out too good. And it's not that I can't stand the sight of blood, because on television, you know, they don't use real blood. They use ketchup. See, it's ketchup. That's what I can't stand the sight of. That's why. I'm <laughs> but I guess I wouldn't make a good surgeon anyway, because that calls for a steely eye and a steady hand. And I tell you the truth, some mornings I stand there 20 minutes shaving my teeth. <laughs> but nothing seemed to be right for me. You know, there, there are lawyer shows, but the, the lawyers, they, they always have to win. And that wouldn't work for me because I'm snake bit a natural flat loser. I could never win. You know, if I bought a turkey farm, they would call off Thanksgiving tomorrow. <laughs> right from the day I was born, I was a loser. My father come in, took one look at me, said to my mother, he said, well, now that that's over, let's start raising a family. <laughs> anyway, uh, we're, we're, we're not going to do a show like that. We decided to do, do a show like this. Something where I'll be surrounded by a lot of talent, you know, and where we'll leave a few blank spaces in which I will attempt to fill in with my unlimited knowledge of trivia, my lilting voice and guitar, and sheer guts. <laughs> Thank you. Now, I'm going to tell you the reason why they handed me this thing. There's a reason for it. On this show, we keep nothing from you. And when you leave here tonight, you will be richer for the experience. Now, we've got this thing. See, we've got a lot of acts on the show. And it's not that I don't know the names of the acts, because I do. It's just that I don't know the order they come in. And they won't tell me. So what they do is they hand me something to give me a clue. 
Now this is a unicycle, and it's from the Greek word meaning, I mean uni, meaning one, and the word cycle meaning, uh, well, see, if you've seen a whole one of these things, then you know that this is a half. It's also the name of the fellows who ride them. Ladies and gentlemen, the wonderful Half Brothers. I don't need any hints or clues or anything because I know him real good. I'm a big fan of his. I got all his records, and his name is Peter Nero. And I'm sure you all know he plays the, uh, you know, it, it's, it's kind of long, and, and it's got a whole bunch of little white things and then little black things, and, and, uh, and it's sort of got a lid that comes up and a stick that, uh, that's funny, I keep wanting to call it a piano. <laughs> but anyway, you're going to love the way he plays this thing, so here he is, Peter Nero.
travel, you meet all kinds of people. And anyway, here's me this one time. I'm on a train from New York to Philadelphia, going over there to look at some acts for this show, not to mention spending an afternoon watching the crack widen on the Liberty Bell. <laughs> anyway, I stroll into the club car, and I bump into this clown, you know, and we get to talking and telling lies, and we end up playing gin rummy, you know, just to pass the time, and one word led to another. And, uh... Uh, let me just show you what can happen when two strangers play cards for money on a train. Now, no floater policy, no nothing. 
<laughs> but the dime I don't owe you, you don't get. Well, will you just check this one one time, hairy ears? Look at here. Solid gold with light up numerals. And a tie clasp to match. There it goes. But I'm still gonna get that dime. I tell you, you are a dead game sport, chubby chin. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Just remember this, pal. Credit cards from all over the world. And there's a picture of Mother. Looks like one of them Italian crocodiles. <laughs> Goodbye, Mother. But you don't get the dime. That's a big drink you order, gentlemen. Oh, fine, fine. Put it right down there. And uh, put it on my tab. There's a little tip for you. You call that a tip? I call that a tip. You oh, call yeah. that a tip. That's it, what you call a in tip. In my language, that's a tip. D-I-P-P -P tip. D-I-P-P -P -P tip. Yes, P -P tip. Right. That's pretty good. D-I-P. Well, I want to show you a tip. Now, there, my friend, is a tip. D-I-P-P-P -P 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 tip. Tip. <laughs> you guys must be kidding. Here's what I think of your tip. <laughs> now, that's integrity. Well, look, don't you understand? I I'm sitting here, my mind. I would have mad much rather. Well, I don't have to so dark at all. Swizzle. You're acting like a couple of kids. Now, what kind of business is that? We're having our own private little argument, and, and he... You know what? He's right. He is absolutely right. He couldn't be no writer. Yeah, yeah, well... I'm sorry, fella. That's okay. Let's just forget it. It huh? never happened. Right, right, yeah. yeah. Uh, say, in all the confusion, you know, you never got paid. <laughs> oh, well, just forget about no, that. No, I, 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 I owe you. No, I owe you. I owe you. No, 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 don't you understand? I'd rather you. have you for my friend. I, I owe you. Look, if you're ever in my part of the country... I you, will, but that's is? beside the point. Yeah. No, I owe you, and you're entitled to it, and here is your dollar thirty-five. I feel so... <laughs> <laughs> Dollar forty-five. Forty-five, huh? Forty-five. One, four, five. Dollar forty-five. Silk brocade robe. Nice. Three silk shirts, handmade. They're beautiful. I like that shape. Yeah. That's a daddy, yeah. Hand tool shaving kit. Yes, it is. Bone China military brushes. Oh, yeah. yeah. You have good days. Silk yeah. pajamas. Yeah. Yeah. Alpaca sweater. I got a green one. A sword and stuff. Yeah. 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 Can I help you a little bit? Yeah. Yama skin slippers. Oh, yeah. they're a beauty. They're for style. Three suitor cakes. Yeah. <laughs> a two suitor case to match the three suitor case. And the train case to match the two suitor and the three suitor. Yeah. And that is integrity. Some integrity. That was my luggage. <laughs> well, that's the way it happened on the train. And uh, it had a happy ending, however, because that fellow got so remorseful, he not only paid me my dime, he joined the Peace Corps, and he's now in Tijuana teaching the natives how to make muscatel out of seawater. <laughs> oh, there you are. Anyway... Oh, excuse me just a second. I think somebody's trying to tell me something. Hey, come on over here. Come here. Come on. Come on. Yeah, you want to tell me something, don't you? See, he, you been eating pizza? He's got a note here. Let's see. It says, I'm one of the very clever Andon's French poodles, and we do our act next. Signed, Fido. F-I-D-E-A-U-X. Dumb poodle can't even spell. Anyway, here they are, Andon's Poodles. Thank you. 
they just handed me that doesn't mean that we got a seal coming out here and it's not that I have anything against seals because I really haven't I never met a seal that I didn't like <laughs> I, no, I love no come on now you guys I like seals that's all there is to it matter of fact is I was one of the founders of national take a seal to lunch week <laughs> I figure it's the least we can do after the dirty deal we gave them I mean, how would you like to go into a nightclub and see your sister hanging in the coat room? <laughs> That's not right, but I digress. You see, this seal reminds me of something. Reminds me of a zoo. And a zoo is where we're going to take you in an imaginary zoo. You're going to meet a couple of talented young people with a bright, fresh approach to comedy. And I was just fortunate enough to see them performing here in a local club. And it's a pleasure to have you meet Joyce Van Patten and Paul Mazursky. <laughs> Hello, monkey. Hello, yes. monkey, baby. Yes. Hello, darling. How are you? <laughs> Hello, monkey. Come on, Come on. Uh, excuse Come on. me, miss. I, I hate to be rude, but it, it's not safe to feed those seals. They bite. No, no, I'm very careful. Well, I read a magazine article about it. I don't... Faye? Beg your pardon? Faye? No. No, my name isn't Faye. Look, Miss, I, I'm not trying to make a pickup in the zoo. I, I know we have met somewhere before. Uh, no, no, I have a very good memory for faces, and I've never seen you in my life. Well, gee, maybe it's deja vu or something. I just, look, look, I'm from San Francisco. You from San Francisco? No, no, I'm from greater Los Angeles. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, I've spent a couple of days down at the beach at uh, Malibu, you know, but never... Well, I, I'm awfully sorry. I didn't mean to be rude or anything well, like that. That's all right. Those things happen part of growing up. <laughs> are, uh, are you here in Reno on a vacation or what? No. No, I, I just got a divorce. You too, huh? How many years were you married? Seven. Seven. And you, how long were you married? I had a five-year investment myself. <laughs> five-year emotional investment. Five years of my life just sort of floating away like a feather. Down the drain. Right down the drain, down never the get drain. it back again. Nope. But I learned one thing from my experience. I learned one little thing. What? I learned that never, 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 ever, 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 will I ever, ever get married again. Never, ever. Are you serious? Positive. <laughs> That is the most amazing thing. What, what, what? Just, this, just this morning, I woke up. You know, I looked in my mirror, and I said, Claire Lovett. Oh, I'm Connor George. Oh, very How nice do you do? Very nice to meet you. I said, Claire Lovett, if there is one thing you are never, ever going to do again, it's to get married. You said that this to morning? To myself this morning in the mirror. I'm getting chills. <laughs> chills are moving up and down my body. And I'm a very young person. Well, you're one of the youngest persons I've ever seen. Well, no, I'm not, I'm not that young. Yeah, you have young hair, young, well. young hair. 
I'm young enough that I had to take the oral vaccine. Oh, I took it too! Yes! Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, little cubes of sugar. sugar! It was so tasty, it's not even fattening. You know, it's Let's get away from those seals. Oh, they do bite, you know. Oh, all right. I wasn't trying to be cute no, before. No, I didn't think you were. I love monkeys, don't you? They're such, oh, yeah. such marvelous creatures. I'm an evolutionist myself, you know. Well, who isn't? <laughs> You're not, you're not toying with me, are you? Oh, no, 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 no. I've been an evolutionist since I was 13 and a half. Chills. Chills are moving up and down my body. I'm getting chills. I love monkeys because monkeys do all the things we would like to do if we had the courage to do it. They know that people are looking through those bars, but yet they continue to do wonderful... They're, they're not repressed, is the word, Poetry. Actually. Repressed uh, is poetry. Well, I use the word quite a lot. Really? <laughs> Golly, they're really not repressed. <laughs> oh. You're a very bold woman, aren't Gee, you? No, I'm not, really. Yes, you are. You're bold and young. It's just that yeah. you, you are. You're, you're very easy uh, for me to talk to. Am I easy? Yes. Yeah. Well, listen, just because I'm divorced doesn't mean that I hate women. I like women very much. Really? As a matter of fact, I called my wife, my ex-wife, yesterday on the phone. I said, Helen, how are things going? Do you want to hear an amazing thing? I phoned Norman, my ex-husband. I called him up this morning. Really? Yes, I wanted to find out if there was going to be a war. Well, what did he say? No, he assured me that there wouldn't be. Oh, thank goodness. Oh, I know. I was so relieved. But, I mean, I respect him that much that I would pick up the telephone. He would be the person that I would call. Do you know how much I respect you for respecting him enough that you picked up the phone and he was the person you called? Do you know the one thing that I have hated my whole life? No. A man who knocks his wife. I cannot stand Chill, him. Chill, chill, chills are moving into my body. <laughs> I cannot stand a woman who would knock her husband or a man who would knock his wife. Because yeah, life is not that easy. You cannot turn it on and off like that. You cannot you turn, turn life on. on and off. You cannot turn it on and off. You cannot turn it on and off. You cannot do it. Oh, it's so easy to talk to you. Do, do you know, you know, it wasn't easy for me to leave my wife. I was very guilty. I went to a psychoanalyst. I spent a lot of money I there. cannot believe what you're telling me. I cannot believe what you are telling me. Would an evolutionist lie in front of a monkey? You have been in analysis. Yes, five months. I cannot tell you the respect I have for someone who has the courage. That is what it takes. It takes real courage to go and to try to find out what's wrong with you. I think it's beautiful. I think it's a beautiful thing. I love you, Claire. I love you. Claire, will you marry me? Claire, give me a chance, Mary. Claire, I still have the ring. Give me a chance, Claire. I have a beautiful ring. Claire, I love, I love I, your I, young face, I, I young lips. I, I don't know if I love you. Claire, I know you love me. No, I, I think I just think I love Claire, you. Claire, you think you love me, but I know that you love me. Gee, I, I don't think I'm really grounded in my love. Claire, Claire, be grounded. Have roots. Claire, you know that if, if I know I love you, then you know you love me, because if I love you, you must know that you love me, because we love each other, because I love you. 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 You're a big woman. Oh, I love you. I love you. I love you. Let's get married. We'll get married. Oh, yes, yes. We can live in my house. I have a charming Spanish stucco on North Fundy Drive in Greater Los Angeles that will just... North Fundy. North Fundy. Oh, no. Did I say before that we had met? Oh, no, no, no. No, wait, no, don't tell me, don't tell me, don't tell me. I'll take a party. A party at your house. house. You came to my house. You came to my house. New Year's Eve. New Year's Eve. 1955. Right. You a came party at your house. A wild, wild party. That's right. You got very drunk. Did I? Well, you danced with Norma. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, it's all, yes, I didn't feel well. I got very dizzy. I remember that. I know. I had to send Norman's suit out to the cleaners. Oh, really? <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I, that's too bad. I... Sorry. I remember your wife. Helen. She was a very tiny person. Well, she was she was five feet tall. I wouldn't say tiny. Uh, she was tinier than most people. Well, but... you had very tall people at that party. I've never seen such big people in one room in my life. I mean, you had Watusis at that party. You had people whose knuckles were dragging on the ground. She was, uh, she was very tiny, and I remember she had very bad teeth. That, well, she was having root canal work done at the time. I wouldn't oh, say bad teeth. Oh, is that why she had those tin cans? Uh, uh, you know, there was a quality about your wife uh, that was um, so much uh, of the people. Kind of uh, charm, you mean, a, a loveliness, charm. Oh, no, I wouldn't use charm. Uh, uh, there was a, there was a, a common, uh, a sort of an, well, she was a peasant, actually. Uh, sort of a... I remember your husband very well. That's all coming back to me. He was sitting in that overstuffed chair, sort of 
purple and blue polka dots, imitation plastic, yes, yes. You were probably renting that furniture, weren't you? Norman made that. <laughs> this interesting taste, one might call it early vulgarity. <laughs> uh, were you in analysis at the time of the party? Yes, yes, I had just begun. I was doing very well. I just oh. broken through, as a matter of fact. Well, I think it's fine. I mean, if one is weak and one can accept the fact that one is weak, uh, then uh, what Claire, else? Claire, it seems to me it takes great, great strength and not weakness to go to a psychoanalyst. No, no, no. It is obviously a sign of weakness to have to pay a perfect stranger a fee to straighten out your bollocks life. Well, obviously, you are a very, 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 very strong woman to make such a comment. No, I am not a strong woman. But I could see where I might tend to frighten a very weak man. Oh, it's getting chilly in here. I think I'll go see them feed the snakes. Arrivederci. In, in all the confusion of putting this show together, I almost overlook one of the most important things that folks like to see on a variety show, a line of beautiful girls. You know, right from the great Zigfeld on down, beautiful girls have been the backbone of show business. And in many cases, everything that surrounds the backbone. <laughs> so yesterday, when I realized my oversight, I called on my friend, an agent, who, who books shows in Las Vegas, and I said, send me over some beautiful showgirls right away. And the stuff, or the girls arrived in the afternoon plane, and I would like for you to meet it, meet them, right now. We don't need a whole bunch. It's as simple as that. You know, what I mean by that is there are not, may not be many women here, but I'll bet you have never seen more women on just two. <laughs> One. Women. Uh, look, I'll tell you, girls, why don't you come down here where the air is a little bit thicker? How about that? <laughs> I, I could have been tall, but I turned it down. <laughs> I, hey, you know you got a freckle up on your clavicle right there? Did you know that? You got a nice clavicle, too. Hey, hey, you guys, you know... You know what that clavicle right there reminds me of? Reminds me of that clavicle right there. Just in there, a couple of smooth clavicles right there. But actually, these two lovely girls aren't just ordinary showgirls. They don't have to do this for a living. You see, during the day, Linda here is a nuclear physicist, and Marilyn is a psychiatrist. And what I'm actually trying to say is that these girls have got it here. They have got it upstairs. <laughs> so you just remember that while you're window shopping on all them other floors. <laughs> But to get on with the show business, to get on with the show business at hand, I am afraid that I made a boo-boo. You see, these girls, they don't do a specialty act by themselves, like singing or dancing, but I didn't know that, not until they arrived. And then I didn't care. <laughs> what they do is they enhance an act. You know, they parade around behind it, and then at certain points in the number, they punctuate. I think I've just been punctuated. <laughs> but really, what I'm getting at, uh, as you were, fellas. Now, the point is, the girls don't have... The girls don't have anyone to punctuate for. But rather than disappoint you folks, I let the girls draft me into helping them out. So, no, actually, I wasn't really drafted either, you know, but they, they did ask me to volunteer. They did do that. 
I ran up and enlisted, is what I did. <laughs> so I'm going to sing a song for them, and the girls are going to do their own intricate punctuating. You know, like if I were doing a marching song, you know, they'd probably go like that. And then you'd know right away that there was a marching song, you know? Right? They understand it. Now, if I sing a lullaby, they might do this. Like, uh, that would be effective, I think. And uh, anyway, they asked me this uh, for this particular song, so we might as well try it. You guys ready? Okay, here we go. Oh, you like it, my pitch pipe up. Just a minute, hold it. Now we're ready. <laughs> Tiptoe to the window, by the window, that is where I'll be Sorry about that. I think that's terrible. I think that's just terrible. You know, I've had shows that were long, and I've had shows that were short, and I've had shows that were canceled, but I have never been bumped off the air. <laughs> Look, I better, I better have a talk with them, okay? I'll just, I'll get them straightened out so quick you won't even believe this. Now, you girls, don't you ever, any time you're ever on, now don't you do that. You cut that, oh, they make me so darn mad. Well, I got them straightened up. You just have to know how to talk to tall girls. <laughs> yeah. Now then, I said before I was going to sing a song, so if you don't mind, I'm going to kind of serious up here for just a moment and uh, sing a lovely ballad. And it's called, Soon I'll Wed My Love. And I'm going to tell you right now, I don't sing it too good, but you probably won't even notice it, because I play the guitar pretty bad.
favorite clue of the whole night right here. This is uh, my diary. And I don't know if you like to reminisce, but I do. Uh, let's see here now. December 9th, <coughs> excuse me, 1942. Tonight, I'm going out with Alice Hummocky. I'm going to ask her to become Mrs. Goble. If she says no, I don't know what I'll do. Boy, I wish I had another shot at that night. <laughs> now, let's see here. Here's one. January 9th, 1943. Today, our house was blessed with the arrival of a chubby little visitor with wrinkled bow legs and no teeth. My mother-in-law moved in. <laughs> great day right there. Now, here's one. Oh, this is the one that I was really looking for, and the only reason for me getting the diary out here in the first place. Tonight, I went to Helsing's Club and saw three terrific guys who call themselves the Harmonicats. And that's how I first ran into them, and they're even greater now than they were then. So, ladies and gentlemen, here they are, the Harmonicats. <laughs> try to get away because we're going to do a little blowing and picking here together because we've done this before. Now, right, is that right? That's right. You're out of breath, aren't you? Oh, just about. <laughs> yeah. Well, look, see, we, we used to work together in Chicago a long time ago, and in between shows, you know, we'd kind of sit around and, and uh, fool around and noodle, and we came up with some arrangements. Uh, well, I remember one, but it wasn't exactly an arrangement. It just sort of happened, like. Do you remember the one I'm talking about? I sure do. You think we could try that? Well, we could give it a fling. It's been a long time, you know, like 14 <laughs> years. All right, all right. Well, uh, you, you, you get us started, right. and I'll join in. You know. Sweethearts are strangers. It makes no difference now. I leave it all. Sweethearts are strangers where we go from here. Sweethearts 
wonderful package, and we want to thank you for being with us. And uh, I guess that's about it. For now, this is your old friend, Lonesome George, leaving you with this bit of advice on social behavior. It is not considered etiquette for a lady to spit in a man's face unless, of course, his mustache is on fire. <laughs> And that's it. That's the jail. A 1962 Alfred Hitchcock produced television pilot that never became a series. But it's part of the legacy of Alfred Hitchcock. That's it. Next week, another film from the career of Alfred Hitchcock. Da 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 Good evening! What? That's it on that one. What? Oh no, wait a second. That one there is finished. Sorry. All right, well, we're doing it. We're doing it.